You are listening to History Man, the platform for historians, authors, and museum directors to tell their stories of the American Revolution, walk in the footsteps of heroes, and proclaim freedom reigns. On today's episode, I am excited to be here at the United States Presidential Culinary Museum in Grover, North Carolina, with the senior curator, Martin Mangello, the author of Terrorist Psychotic, Mary Patton. Welcome, Martin. Hey, thank you, Eric. Yeah. Absolutely. Martin, I've listened to your book on Audible. Tell our listeners a little bit about your book, where they can get it, what it's about. And let's just get into the meat of Mary yeah. Patton. She's an interesting character of the American Revolution. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, obviously, you know, we're in Barnes & Noble, Amazon, uh, Ingram. So every private bookstore, you can get us anywhere and everywhere. Uh, most people these days are listening on Kindle and this was the first book, Eric, that I ever did with Audible and went through the whole Screen Actors Guild, you know, auditions of uh, actresses because I wanted a lady reader from all over the world. And it led me to release my book in paper, uh, of course, through e-readers, but also for the first time, this is my eighth book via Audible. This is uh, actually a project that you did to to finalize one of your degrees, correct? Yes, sir. This was my second master's, and I wanted to do that. And, and my professor, Dr. Hank Weddington at Lenore Ryan University, told me, you know, Marty, you don't actually have to publish a book to get your master's degree, okay? But you are the only student that's doing that. So God bless you, you overachiever. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I am a fanatic and a control freak and full-on OCD and, and have to do everything better than everyone else. And I spend a lot of time laughing at myself, Eric. Grover, North Carolina is actually in a very historical part of the country, especially in terms of the American Revolution. This is the backcountry of the Carolinas, and, and uh, it was called at that time Tryon, or the, the, uh, right. the Tryon County area, or the, and the Tryon Association, which is a uh, big declaration that came out after Concord and Lexington. The signers of that Tryon Association, one of them being Frederick Hambright, uh, another one being uh, one of the Neals, I believe it was Andrew Neal. These were these were big heroes in this mm -hmm. section of the of the country, right? Absolutely. You're in the the famous Hambright home right now. Is that this right? This is this is our home, and this was built by the great great grandson of Colonel Frederick Hambright. His name was Doctor Alfred Frederick Hambright. I see. I so see. so. Welcome to the Hambright home. Of Prussian descent, correct? That's right, yeah. I mean, we're not talking Scotch-Irish or Welsh or, or or any number of other backgrounds. This is actually a, a Prussian descent, That's the Hambright. Right. A very weird Prussian because he does not go with the German king. Is that right? Yeah, it's kind of weird. It's a weird anomaly, and, and people are a bit shocked, and that's one of the things that he says. Um, we are going to have what new idea here. And uh, sick and tired of having the baby, the fetus, is the new leader. So fetus grows up, starts to walk erect, becomes teenager, and then, you know, uh, takes the throne, uh, becomes new leader. We are sick and tired of this process of czar, emperor, king, queen, whatever you want the word you, to use, caliph, em emir. We are tired of this process on earth, and we are going to use the new English word election for leader. You will watch us change the earth pattern. And people are like, yeah, we're going to watch you change the, what did he say, the earth pattern? Right. What an idiot. Right. What an idiot. And, uh, yeah, I mean, they did. They thought we were crazy, and why would you want to attack the government here in America? That's crazy, too. You want to shoot into troops that are here in America. That's what you, and you're going to secret meetings, Eric, on, on Thursday nights in a basement. It's not funny. It's, it's not cute, and, I, and, and as far as asking me, do I want to be involved in it and go to the... No, I don't. I don't want to go to the secret meetings to talk about this crazy crap. You're out of your damn mind, I reckon, okay? Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's a lot of people around here in the upcountry of South Carolina and the back country where we're at today, in now the North Carolina, that these are the conversations that are going on, and during our tours, we often have people ask me, um, excuse me, Martin... Are you talking about QAnon today and Proud Boys, or are you still therapeutically giving the tour back in the 1700s? 
I, I'm just confused, Martin, as to where you are, first person or third person, or I'm like, no, ma'am, I was just explaining the 1700s. I'm not in what the proud boys are. No. Okay. But it is interesting because Cup Seifert even even mentions this in one of his episodes that the discussions they were having over government rights in in that time in the seventeen seventies seventeen eighties those same discussions those those discussions of freedom liberty government those are the same discussions we are having even today exactly and, and it's interesting how. The Constitution that we have set up allows those discussions to happen, right? Absolutely. And uh, so it, it's a it's a beautiful thing, uh, but it is not for the faint of heart, right? Absolutely. And Colonel Hambright is in this book. Is that right? So are his friends. Um, in fact, the paintings that we had done and have commissioned over the past 14 years are in here of many of the heroes. And that's also what I wanted to do. You mentioned Colonel Hambright. Um, you'll see a lot of his friends in here in full color. Uh, like Colonel Cleveland and the black hero at the Battle of Kings Mountain, Ishmael Titus. These are all forensically rebuilt paintings. Uh, the Catawba hero, uh, Captain Redhead, you know, who fought with us and went against the Cherokee. Um, there's the, the picture of the black hero, Ishmael Titus, here with his brother, Primes, at the battle. And this took, like, literally this long. There's, of course, Mary Patton. She's been our latest that we had done. But, but people always said when I came here, Eric, um, nobody knows or understands what any of these people that live around here look like. We've never seen them. And regrettably, Marty, um, and we know that you just retired from the military and all that, and, and you're moving back from the deserts, and you lived in Japan for many years and all that. Mm -hmm. But now that you're back to America, because I left when I was 18 for the military. Right. But now that you're retired and back, um, it's great. And you married this lady from here, my wife Stormy. But we don't know what they look like. And here's Colonel Hambright. So we had to go to these families and spend upwards of like three years at a time forensically rebuilding them. And you always have to get permission from the family that says in the end, you know, yeah, that's, that's okay. That painting, we do mm -hmm. agree with it. And mm -hmm. we've analyzed the line drawings from the artist. And so go ahead. Here's, here's a course... Uh, Andrew Hampton, one of the oldest people, if not the oldest person at the Battle of Kings Mountain. All these people had to be forensically rebuilt. And so that took time to feature like Colonel Hambright. And then you want to hear him for the first time in American history. You want to hear Colonel Hambright. You say to yourself, right? Um, I want to hear him talk out loud. What's he got to say? What does who have to say? You, Colonel Hambright. Yeah, I'm sitting here listening. You want to hear what, what these people say, and you want to hear the arguments. You want to hear the arguments against these slack jaw buck tooth hillbillies. Yeah, we do, and we are sick of hearing them, okay? And hearing you talk. <laughs> what is funny to us is to listen to the spires you are going to build, that are going to jot around Charlottesburg. The spires. Do you listen to yourself speak at all, sir? The spires that were jot into the sky. That's what you said someday and your noted establishments of education that you would create here. If you drive your wagon through that this time through Charlottesburg, you'll be lucky if the damned spoke doesn't snap and the Conestoga wheel busts off of it, literally from the mud roads. And you're going to build great establishments of education and your universities and your spires, do you listen to yourself, sir, when you speak? Your spires that would jot into the sky. Are you a flat jaw jackass? And these are the arguments that are going on. Right, Eric. right. Okay, now, now, flash forward 250 years, where are we? How asinine and childish was this uh, process of election and the spires? How asinine was it, Eric? It, it's doing pretty damn good. It is. It's pretty pathetic when you think about it. we are the last country on earth to have a constitution. It is the oldest constitution running on the earth. Many other countries have tried and started and had a revolution and, and failed and have gone back or collapsed or had a coup. Just last month we had, I think, two more coups in Africa. One of them was a part of Guinea. Um, it's pretty sad when you think about this country that we're sitting in right now is the oldest running constant. And we are so young. That's right. We are so young as a country. That's right. 
It's, it's a beautiful time of of history to to look at to to research, and uh, I find myself almost peeling back an onion every time I open up another book or listen to someone like you talk, and uh, I'm on the edge of my seat. Tell us a little bit about Mary Patton. Absolutely. So Mary is an American shero, and that's what we call them today. So everyone is pissed off about, oh, it's another thing we have to start using. They already took flight attendant away, and now we have to call them stewardess. It's like, all right, okay, you know, we can all change. Um, if they were able to change the world 250 years ago, we can all change with it, okay? Right. So we're calling her a Shiro, Shiro now, and she rose. Um, and, and honestly, Mary is an expert black powder maker, which is really difficult crap to build, okay? Uh, she learns this from her father. She's a, a, a Scottish lady from, from Scotland. Was uh, she from Scotland? Yes, that's where they so moved So she from. came over... About in one of the great migrations from Absolutely. from That's Ulster right. Scott to to I don't know from Ulster Scots, but okay. McKeon is her real name. Mary McKeon is okay. is the real name, and so uh, they move over, living in Pennsylvania, and before they leave Carlisle, Pennsylvania, to move down south to the Forbidden Zone up on the other side of the mountain where no white is supposed to be, right. uh, in Western North Carolina. And for her to become a North Carolinian in fame, um, she does for the past couple of months before she leaves Carlisle, meets a very famous American Shiro that we now call Molly Pitcher, who has just moved to Carlisle, Pennsylvania. So, so she did meet her. Yes. That, that's actually a historical we, we record. We don't have a historical record on that yet, like a letter to point to, but we know that the two of them were very prominent you know, in the, the revolutionary times. And so since this is a creative work, fiction from the Thomas Wolfe Institute, okay. where I went to school, I had to write in creative fiction. But when people ask me, do you have a, a supporting document, like a letter from, you know, Molly Pitcher to, no, I don't. Okay. I don't. But we know that she lived there. We know that that's a fact and that's proof. So of all the places to end up, she ended up in the Watauga area or the over That's the mountain right. regions. Uh, That's right. How did she end up there? Who did she, was she invited down there? She was invited down by a very famous black powder making family who who said, you know, you got to come down here. Um, you guys make excellent grades of powder, okay, in Pennsylvania. But with the war starting, and 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 think about that too. Molly Pitcher's husband is a cannoneer, right? Okay, <laughs> and Mary makes, you know, powder. Okay, mm -hmm. she can do that if you want that for your cannon, if you want it for your pistol, if you want it for your rifle. A lot of people don't know that there's different black powders for each, okay? And even with a rifle, you're carrying two different kinds of powder, okay? Uh, Mary's powder is so famous up in Pennsylvania, it's often equated into beautiful shops that have glass windows and fancy streets with carriages and, and, and things like that. You know, restaurants, mm -hmm. restaurants, is, this is how she grows up restaurants in the Philadelphia and, and you know, um, it's often equated with Swiss powder is super famous. And what has been going on for about two years, Eric, is, is England is not stupid. They've been strangling, getting out, taking up, picking up, buying up, shutting down any black powder in the colonies. They've been doing this for about two years before the explosive detonation of the war begins. They know what's coming, and black powder is getting very scarce, so um, she is invited to come down. But, you know, some of the things I talk about in my book is uh, visitors will come and ask, is there a clock around? Excuse me, is there a clock somewhere nearby here that I can synchronize my pocket watch to? They're like, no, we use a stick in the ground at 12 o'clock, and we, the shadow, okay? You use a stick in the ground. Mrs. Patton. Uh, they're asking them to come down to a very remote area um, in the middle of nowhere, which eventually becomes the Tennessee. Mm -hmm. but, but that's the proposition, is you will live in the western North Carolina area and on the black side of the mountain in the dark hole where no whites are supposed to be, but we have our own little settlement. Mm -hmm. And that's what convinces her and her husband to come down, John. And, and actually in my book, you'll read, um, as part of one of them, the first visit, the answer is no. 
Okay. Thank you so much. It was great to have you guys stay here at the house and to mm-hmm. cook for you and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but John, her husband, an Irish guy, John Patton, uh, who marries Mary McKeon, we've talked about it last night with Pillow Talk and then in private this morning, and we are so sad to let you guys know, but the an- the final answer is no. And so people were shocked in my book to to read that as well. The, you know, the answer was no, and wow, I mean, you, you chronicled that. So it takes a couple of letters and time and to see what the English are doing. And then the pamphlets that, that go out, you know, don't forget the king owns all excrement. That's a law. Is that right? Absolutely. That's a law. <laughs> That's a very well known law. So, and, and, and you are to send it. When the pamphlets come down here to South Carolina and North Carolina, and the Savannah and Charlestown, and people start getting these these threefold pamphlets that all excrement, all outhouses, all human fecal matter, all chicken, pig, horse, all dung is to be collected and loaded up on massive carts that we will pay for with four horse teams to drive to the last black powder plant outside of Philadelphia. We are actually at this point in such extremis with, with Mr. Washington you have got to do what you're told. We need the poop. That's how bad it is because that nitre, which is made from poop, is one of the three critical ingredients to make black powder. So you have poop, you have yes. coal, you have charcoal, charcoal, and you have sulfur. sulfur. Yes. So when she moves down to the over the mountain regions, uh, in that Holston Valley, that yes. uh, that Cinch River Valley area. Is there sulfur there? There actually is sulfur deposits with mines. That's one of the things she asks is, well, where would I get my sulfur then? And they're like, don't worry she? about that. Yeah, right. Okay. How old is she? At She's this like point? 20s, 30s at this point. Late 20s. Yeah. Is that 30s, right? Yeah. And so she has everything. She has That's the big right. three. That's, but it's even better than that. Okay. And this is part of what pissed me off. Okay. Because okay. I fester. And I want to claw and gnaw away and dig mm-hmm. at stuff, you know, like you. And I want to figure out, you know, what the real truth is that's going on. And so to do that, I often ask myself, what are the, the things that she needs to be successful? And, yeah, those three are going to be, obviously, to make black powder. But the fourth one no one ever mentions is, is just raw power, okay? To, you're going to either do your black powder mill um, you know, through the, it's very dangerous to make black powder. So some people stamp it, mm-hmm. okay, and they run a mill. Well, we don't have electricity to run the stamp machines with an armature, but we have water power where she lives. Okay, she lives right on that river there. We have tremendous water power. They tell her, "Don't worry about power. You're going to live right on the river, and we can do a dam with a water wheel." And don't worry about that. Okay, uh, she's got the sulfur taken care of. Of course, poop. She says, you, you know then they're strangling out all of the poop is being delivered to this one plant that's left here outside of Philadelphia making the black powder. Okay, if that one falls and goes down, and there's nothing for the south, okay? There's nothing, no, there's no black powder down here, okay? I was talking to the curator down at the powder magazine in Charleston, and she said there wasn't any powder coming in to to the colonies. And they had, within their powder magazine, French black powder, which was supposedly better than the British black powder, and they were were concerned about that. So this black powder manufacturing was huge for the South. Absolutely, absolutely. And, And for her to agree to come down here and do that would be unbelievable. So... The poop is a huge question. Mm-hmm. Where would I get all of me poop then? Because you don't have enough cattle right. or animals on the site, I understand. And please pardon me for all the questions and consternation. Please pardon me, Boyle. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, don't worry about the poop, okay? And don't worry about the, the lack of sheep and cows, and we don't have enough poop here. But here's what we do have, and this is what I wanted to chronicle and document scientifically, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to, to bring new stuff to the market, I was sick and tired of hearing about the generalized, regurgitated crap on Mary Patton. Everybody no has the same thing to say. Yeah, yeah no pun intended, right? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. She sold her powder for a dollar a barrel. She was a very rich woman. She had 4,300 acres when she died. 
They have about a classic five to six things to say about this woman, and the whole story's over, okay? And I was like, you know what? There's a lot more here, and boy, where is she getting? They told her these bat caves that are here are probably thousands, if not 10,000 years old, Mary. And they have been pooping for so long, it's on the floor. And she was, hold on one second. You're talking about bat, like the bat that flies around then? They're like, yes, we're talking about the nighttime bat, the black bat. And you go into some of these caves, and there's 60, 70, 80,000 bats hanging from the ceiling. You're either full of malarkey, or I want to see it myself. I'm telling you it's true, and she, the, excuse me again for interrupting you. The reason I'm so interested in the bat poop is because it is actually the finest poop to use. If you actually have access to that bat poop, um, we have do not have access to it up here in the north. Okay, from Boston all the way down to, we have not seen that here. And it, it sucks because, you know, the British, again, I'm going to tell you, Eric, they're not stupid. Sulfur, only really on Earth at the time, comes from one place, okay? Do you know where that place is? No, tell me. It's in Sicily. And guess who controls that friggin' island? The they're British. not stupid, <laughs> okay? So they've got a lockdown on sulfur. They've, they've strangleholded two years before this revolution all black powder that would be available and all production and capability. And they're really, when Mary finds out that there's bat poop available, she almost has a conniption, they say, okay, and spasms. And she says, I have one final thing for you then, because the charcoal, we can make that all day and night long, okay? You could make charcoal, Eric, if you want to, okay? We'll just use an old fire. I'm sure you have a fire in the back of your property and it's loaded. You probably need to shovel it out because you haven't done it. We can make charcoal all day long, boy. Okay? Okay, but we did want to mention one other thing, Mary. We weren't finished yet before. I didn't get a chance to, to tell you that we would be surrounded where you live. Yes, tell me about it then. Go on. You would be surrounded by pine forests. Everywhere around here and down here in this southern, western North Carolina area, when you move to western North Carolina, Mary... It's loaded jackknife plum full with pine forests. Eric, how many pine trees did you drive? Did you drive past today? That's all there is. Down endless, here. endless, endless. And there was more during that time. Let me tell you a little scientific fact. If you're a black powder shooter like me, and you use Gox, G O E X, it's one of the most expensive, finest black powders you could use. Gox. Mm -hmm. Everyone listening to this knows what I'm talking about. Okay, they use pine for their charcoal. It is preeminently, scientifically, the number one charcoal that you would want to burn and use, along with the bat poop. And she says, and you've got the sulfur taken care of. We don't need to beg them to buy the sulfur fake in Paris from Sicily, the only deposit of sulfur on this planet. Okay, You've got the secret sulfur. You've got the power. You've got the secret bat poop that nobody knows where it's at. And you can take me to these caves and we'll make the maps with the X's on them, will you now then? Oh, absolutely we will. We're looking forward to it, Mary. And you've got the pine. You have got an unprecedented, we do, we have an unprecedented collusion, collision of four factors, Eric, in scientific history. And when you talk about poop, okay, this woman is an expert at making niter, the crystallization of it. She's got massive batches. She can tell you that one there is a four and a half month. I have accurate records here in the books. Okay? And that one we're going to take you into. And that barn there, we're at about six months. It's almost perfect crystallization. Then this woman is an expert freaking black powder maker, bro. Sounds like she's very meticulous and has a business mind to her as well. She does. Which is, you know, she does. phenomenal. She, she has a weird business mind, Eric. She refuses wholesaling. She will not allow you to stock her powder. When she's here at Captain Jack's Tavern in Charlotte, they ask. You know, we would actually, we could buy like 40 of your one pound kegs when you're gone in Wilmington. Yeah, I know that's where you're headed to next and then down to the Savannah. And you're going to make a triangle and head all the way back. So she made, her, her trips were from the over-the-mountain regions 
down yes. to Wilmington through Charlotte? She would go to Wilmington, to the Savannah, to Charlottetown, all the way through Charlottesburg, all around here, Camden. Everybody knows Mary Patton. Is that right? Yes, everybody knows Mary Patton. And, but a very weird businesswoman. She will not. I appreciate the comment that you would purchase 40 to 60, and you would stock them here, Jack, and sell them then. No, no, you will not. Okay, I do not wholesale. I sell me to the person who wants to buy one 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 pound right now. It's a dollar a pound. It's a very simple proposition. I am direct from factory to purchaser. I do not wholesale. Okay, and I don't care about how much more I would be able to sell and, and all these other factors. I am uninterested. This is how she accumulates tremendous wealth and owns 4,300 acres at her death. I would think that the British would have been on to her. <laughs> oh, she's a wanted woman, which is many people were angered at me, Eric. I still have people who are pissed off at me um, in Tennessee and all around Elizabethton. And they're like, I won't sell the book. I'm not going to sell the book. Why? Okay? You, because you denigrated us, Marty. And I don't know why you put that on there, terrorist psychotic. I'm like, but that's what they called her. I'm sure that word was not even in the in the dictionary. Yes, it was in the frickin' Samuel Johnson's dictionary. Terror, okay, and, and psycho, these are English words. Well, the, you have F, the F word in there too, and I don't like that. It's a disgusting. That word has been around since like the 1400s. Somebody attacked me on Amazon, said he has curse words that were not invented until the 1900s. It's like... Okay, and it was used in that period, and and all these words, and that's what they called her. They called her a terror worker, and that's what they would say, Eric. Anyone who is making bombs and distributing black powder to these psychos, do you realize that they want to detonate a bomb inside of a building, and where is the man who's doing this? He is hiding outside of the building, about a hundred feet away. Looking inside, waiting for it to erupt with officers asleep in there. Where was this? This was all over the American Revolution. Okay. Mm -hmm. This was all the arguments that people had against doing this form of la petite guerre, guerrilla warfare. And yet today we turn on Fox or CNN and if they say there's a bomb going into a Russian barracks where they're sleeping in 82 and we have it on the, the, the bomb with the drone from the Ukrainians, and we can watch it going all the way down until it explodes. Every one of those channels is on. Everyone's on. Oh, breaking news. Put it on. Put it on. Duh. Everyone's watching that. Mm -hmm. But in these days, this psycho, and that's what they say, this crazed woman who is illegally producing black powder for these freaks, these buck tooth hillbillies that live all around here, there's about a quarter million of us that live here. Mm -hmm. People often ask me, well, Marty, how many people did live around here? I'm like, it's about a quarter million live around here. Okay, for the up country and the back country, you want facts and figures? You want real numbers? Okay. Didn't have a census and stuff like that, but we have the facts and figures. Um, <laughs> ¶¶